Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the session on tracing and visualizing file system internals with eBPF superpowers. Um, I am Suchakra Sharma, and with me is Hani. Um, so before we begin a little bit about us, uh, I'm Suchakra. I did my PhD from Polytechnic Montreal. Uh, I work as a staff scientist in Shift Left Inc. And with me is Hani. Yes, this is Hani. I also have a PhD from uh, Ecole Polytechnic Montreal. Where we, we work, I worked with uh, Sushakra there. Uh, I'm also now a uh, software engineer at Microsoft. Uh, I'm working on uh, performance analysis of kernel, different kernels like Linux and Windows. So I go over to Sushakra. Okay. So uh, our agenda is pretty much packed today. So what we will be discussing it is uh, the first we'll start with file system internals. We'll do a little bit brush up of what file systems are. Uh, we'll go through the journey of a simple read syscall. Uh, we'll see how tracing is done uh, using a tool like ftrace. Uh, then we'll go and discuss file system and how do you measure performance of file system uh, by looking at certain probe points inside the system or what the system already provides. Uh, we'll use uh, procfs, uh, sysfs, and we'll also learn how BCC and BPF, BPF trace tools are there. Uh, we'll then move ahead on uh, building tools with eBPF itself uh, by understanding what BPF-based tools are, uh, take a small case study, and build a completely new tool that you could also do. We call it read ahead stat. We'll end by visualizing the performance uh, of uh, that tool. So let's begin. Um, what is a file system in itself, or why do we actually need a file system? So in very simple terms, we first needed to keep track of things. We are doing a lot of things in our processes. Our processes are accessing certain files. How many files are being currently read? How many files are being currently written? There are many operations that are going on. We want to track most of those operations. Uh, we also want to understand what is the structure of the data that is stored inside the file system. We want to know where that data is, uh, how you would access that data, uh, or if how a simple process could access that data, or what happens if you move uh, the data from one place to another place, how it is now structured in this new format. Uh, and the third is abstraction and uniformity. So we don't want to implement each and every uh, access in a very different manner. So for example, if you have a file on a network storage and you are moving it to a USB drive, uh, you want to know that that move is gonna happen perfectly if you're having a read syscall for a different file system and a read syscall for another file system, that won't work. So you want some sort of uniformity and you also want some sort of abstraction so that uh, you can easily access it. So um, let's, let's look at a very simple example here. So for example, what's happening right now here is an app is trying to open a file and obviously that file is loaded somewhere on the disk. So in an idle case, uh, you would just say open and the file gets open, but uh, that's not what's gonna happen. Uh, today's uh, systems are very complex and there are multiple layers of things that happen in between and it, it's just not that simple. Maybe in older days, it was very simple where you would have a small microcontroller where, where the files are stored directly in the data segment and you can actually access them directly from a, a simple memory address and you would just be able to access it, but not, not these days, systems are more complex. So what actually happens is that you have this layer uh, inside the operating system kernel, which has all these different sections and a simple call like an open would then go through all these different layers. Like first it would go to the syscall interface, then the VFS layer where VFS uh, calls are made, where, which is like the first level of abstraction. Uh, and then it would reach the logical file system based on what kind of file system is implemented on the uh, on the device from which it is supposed to be accessed. And then the block layer, which actually uh, bundles up multiple reads, bundles up multiple writes, and actually makes calls to the drivers to access something. And all of this is supported by caches in your file system. So all these caches are, uh, uh, are going to reduce the effort of this whole calls being going all the way. So for example, there is inode cache and directory cache. Uh, to keep track of what files are open, what files can be open. Uh, and if the files are being reused, uh, you could just directly use files from there. Uh, and things which are already open and in memory, you would have you would keep them in page cache so you can avoid a lot of uh, transaction costs which would happen if you uh, 
had to access the files from below. So uh, all in all, we have these small cases of uh, systems. And uh, if you are aware of uh, Linux kernel map, uh, this is obviously not the complete map, but this is just a indication. You would see this section for storage. And this is kind of like the section which explains what would happen if a small, if a call would reach the topmost layer and how it would eventually reach the layers below, such as the disk controller layers. So uh, this brings us to what is actually happening when a call is actually made. So um, we start with something very simple called as um, a read syscall, and we'll just see what happens to that read syscall. So we'll use a tool called as ftrace, uh, and we record what's happening in the, in the trace. And the moment a read syscall reaches, uh, we are trying now trying to record the whole control flow of what is happening inside the Linux kernel. And what we get the moment we record this is this big chunk of data. And this is eight MB of data for two seconds. And for just one read syscalls, there were other five syscalls which happened in this small duration. And all in all, there were 5,550 function calls which happened. So as you can see, there's a lot of things that are going on inside the system. So a simple read which your app does is not just a simple read. A lot of things actually go on uh, beneath it. And which actually gives us, um, uh, you know, it, it tells us that we should learn a little bit more about what's happening. So let's look at this first section of what's happening in this trace. I've just taken one small thing and we can see the things that we discussed before where the call would reach a syscall interface, virtual file system layer or logical file system layer. Uh, those calls are actually being made here with this in this control flow trace. And what you have in this control for trace, which is taken from F trace, is not just this uh, very simple thing, but it's also something more complex, where the trace would also store um, uh, tra uh, trace would also store uh, um, uh, timestamps. And with these timestamps, you would have uh, information about which CPU the the code was running on and also which process started it and the PID of the process. So we have a lot of information already inside this and you have, you can actually see there would be issues right now in the, in, in this simple trace, even that there is an IRQ exit entry and an IRQ ex exit. So there was a small stall and, and this gives us an impetus to kind of like understand more about what was happening in the system. Which brings us to the next section, which is how do we measure this performance? We, we saw that in the previous slide that there was an RQ entry and an RQ exit. So something got stalled during the syscall. So we want to probably know something more, what happened uh, with this. Or are, they, are the occurrence of these kind of stalls uh, much more common? Uh, so what, that's what we'll discuss in performance. So what happens in modern operating systems is that uh, there is a layer called as PROC, a PROC file system. And you can access a lot of information about what's happening with the disk, what's happening with the, uh, with the specific process, how the block requests are being made by just doing things like uh, cat slash proc disk stats. And it will give you disk stats for those disks. But, uh, disks. but as you can see, this is a little bit difficult to understand. For example, in this case, uh, these are all these cryptic numbers which are shown and they all have some meaning. Like uh, we have information about milliseconds spent in all disk trees here, for example. So, you have a lot of information which is stored in the prop file system itself, but a lot of this information is not easily available. So you have tools such as IOSTAT, which are built over the prop file system and the uh, SysFS, uh, which can give you much more human readable and much more interesting information so that you can know uh, what your disk, disk pressure is at this point, what process is basically trying to consume a lot. There are many other tools like that which are there. So I'll also suggest you to go to IOTOP and see what IOTOP does. So uh, let's go on to why do we need some more advanced techniques than the ones that we just have. So obviously we see that the system has exposed us to a lot of uh, uh, you know, data through events which we can actually understand. Uh, but why do we need something more? So the first thing is we would want to do targeted analysis. In the other, uh, other systems such as ProcFS and SysFS or any other tooling, you would have data which is already provided to you. You would read it and you, would, uh, you, cannot, do, you cannot go further than what the tool can give you. So uh, in a case like this where you would have wanted to know uh, the IRQ entry and exit delay for just this specific syscall, uh, you would have wanted to actually put some probe points. So it's just like you would 
do an analysis on an electronic device. You just want those probes to be there and you know you, you want to hook onto them these specific kernel functions and see how much time did it take. So this kind of targeted analysis is required. And at the same time, we want some live or programmatic analysis. Well, the problem with other tools or the problem with tools like Perf or Ftrace is that they would provide a lot of information, but it's after the fact. So, which means post-mortem, something bad happened, you want to look at the trace, now you want to see what happened. Uh, what we want to do with tracing is also live and programmatic analysis. For example, you have some conditions, condition one, condition two, uh, you only want to begin the trace and actually you want to measure that specific snapshot of the trace uh, for a given series of conditions. So, this, uh, this makes the analysis more programmatic and more targeted. So that, that's one of the requirements that we have. And um, this is of huge uh, benefit because it can also give you live results of something wrong that is happening. You can uh, keep your conditions and start monitoring things. So what happens is that these conditions these days can be expressed as BPF programs inside the Linux kernel itself. We will come back to it later eventually when we discuss in detail how these conditions and how these programs, BPF programs are written. But for now, let's just uh, say that these are just simple conditions and simple programs that are written uh, in some language and then pushed down inside the kernel so that you can have a more stateful and programmatic way of uh, monitoring systems. So, uh, now to move on, let's, let's look at a little bit more. Uh, so there are tools which have been written using this programmatic manner. And uh, one of the two, one of the uh, collection of tools is BPF trace. So BPF trace basically allows you to uh, write tools in a small DSL called as uh, BPF traces own language. And the programs are uh, like this uh, BIO latency dot BT, for example, you can go to the IOWISER BPF trace uh, link and see uh, where these tools are, uh, where these tools are actually in what they do. So we have just a small collection of tools like block IO latency, where you can see that these three probes were connected at some place. And the moment these probes are connected, you can actually do a lot with the probes and get information. For example, here, uh, the block IO latency uh, tool just tells you that uh, most, in, in this case, you can see that the most block operations took between 1K to uh, 2K microseconds. Uh, so this looks pretty good, uh, but you can easily identify that if the histogram was shifted a little bit more down, uh, you, you can clearly see that there must be an issue. So these kind of small nifty tools are live programmatic tools, uh, which give you information. Uh, and they are all based on simple tracing of the system with BPF itself. Another one is a block IO snoop, which basically is all the trace events and it tells latencies from each of the uh, commands. For example, here is checksum, which is running and you can see the latency for each block event. So this would obviously generate a lot of information. There are many other tools uh, which are BPF trace tools and some are BCC tools, which we will discuss a little bit more in depth. Uh, these are written in a mix of Python and C. So uh, we'll come back to what exactly is happening, what these tools are written because our tool itself, the one which you'll be building towards the end of the uh, talk is also something very much like this. Uh, this brings us to the next section on how do, uh, how do we build tools with BPF itself. So, uh, the role of BPF in observability, as you, can, as you already must have known or must have heard uh, during this time of last few years where the technology of BPF has been evolving, uh, BPF is kind of like a universal technology these days because it's very much inside the Linux kernel and a lot of... Uh, um, infrastructures and frameworks can easily access it. So it's now acting like a single programmatic way to trace and monitor all the aspects of the software, be it operating systems, apps, networks, user space, kernel, any, any aspect of that. So you could hook onto any user space function, kernel space function, and then start extracting data from it uh, in a very low overhead and a very programmatic manner. You could write programs which then tell uh, this, uh, tell the kernel that only record these snapshots of traces when these, these, these conditions are met. So the workflow generally is to basically create your observation tool in user space. You do it with Python uh, or a mix of C uh, or even um, uh, this DSL, which is the BPF trace DSL. You would write a program like that. It gets compiled down to BPF bytecode and it's sent to the kernel and it's attached to certain hooks inside the kernel. So most of the functions that the kernel can actually be hooked onto. 
as we were discussing before. So it gets attached to that hook and then it starts executing. And as it executes, whenever the condition is meant, whenever that kernel function is hit, it starts returning data back to the buffers. So let's, let's uh, look at it from a very simple example uh, that we are taking here. So here's a target app. It's doing something, it's, it's doing multiple reads, for example, like uh, a app which is probably doing some video encoding and needs to fetch data from the device. So, so it does a, a number of reads and the reads are going through the VFS layer down to the block layer into the device layer, normal operation. Now we want to understand what's happening inside these different layers or in one of these layers. So what we would do is we will start writing our tool. Our tool is written as a BPF program. It's usually in C compiled down to BPF bytecode. Uh, and then we also write a small control program. It's, it's usually joined. So it's the control program is attached to the BPF program in itself in our case at least, uh, which can provide some sort of control on when to read data, what, to, what data to read, et cetera. So the moment you use this uh, eBPF program, it gets compiled down to the BPF bytecode. It contains its own code itself, as well as some maps, the definition of these maps where the data would go. Uh, and using this special BPF uh, syscall, this uh, code is then pushed down to the BPF VM. Uh, the BPF VM just verifies it that everything is safe to run and then converts the uh, data back to, uh, starts, starts taking this BPF bytecode and attaching it to hooks inside the Linux kernel. So these hooks can be in different layers. Here we have a hook in the VP, VFS layer and we have attached the BPF program there. So the BPF program is now ready. So every time the call comes to the VFS layer, uh, it would also go to the program, the program executes, and uh, then it goes back to the block layer and continues. So now what happens during the program execution? So one thing that can happen is that it can start communicating with your user space tool uh, via BPF map. So you would store data in the maps uh, from the program and you can fetch that data back uh, using the user space tools or it can write data to the trace buffers. And, and collectively, all this can be used to visualize what is exactly happening uh, on the system at this uh, particular point. Um, now I'll let Hani explain a small use case on what we can do with this. Thank you, Chakra. So I'm gonna go over a use case here. And the use case, the use case that we choose, um, it's about ready ahead. First, I'm gonna explain ready, uh, red, uh, red read ahead buffer, and then um, I'm gonna show you a small demo for that. So imagine that you have a, a video streaming uh, platform and you have some services, and definitely, definitely uh, those, <clears throat> I mean, uh, this kind of platform, it needs to read a lot from the disk, it needs a lot of this access, bring them to the memory, and then uh, the service could, uh, could use those uh, from the memory. To accelerate and uh, to increase the performance, uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, some methods are being introduced, like um, adding adding cache in memory. So, <clears throat> so whenever we, we read uh, we read a, um, I mean a file, we bring it to the memory, we keep it there. Maybe later someone is going to use it. Another approach is using uh, read ahead. So in read ahead, actually we, I mean as 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 as, a, as an application, we don't one it's right now one we don't want the uh, the file uh, the file block right now but there is a there is a way that os goes and uh, predict that okay we, next we are going to access this so i'm going to bring it uh, for you maybe you you are going to uh, you are going to use it later so that's a read ahead approach uh, and then maybe we use it or maybe we don't use it later but <clears throat> So, uh, so how, sorry. Okay, so, uh, so the, the thing is, <clears throat> so is it possible for, for an app to, uh, to do that? Yes, it's possible for app to advise the OS and uh, to do the efficient uh, re-ahead, uh, re-ahead and if, if, for example, the app is reading sequential read, so it could, it could, I mean, tell the, um, tell, the OS to uh, read it, uh, I mean, to do a, sequ a sequential read ahead uh, for it. But the, the issue is, <clears throat> is it, um, the issue is, uh, the issue is, do really app, 
I mean, apps uh, know, uh, know, <clears throat> know how to use it. I mean, how to use uh, such an advice or uh, even though in a modern, modern app, uh, so there are um, several la layers of inf infrastructure. So, so for example, they're in a VM. So do they, do they know, have the knowledge to do that? Or then there is no such an insight for the OS or uh, the hardware that uh, the application is running. So definitely we need a very dynamic and uh, dynamic tool and to, to be able to observe and see what's going on in the system to find, and, uh, find uh, the issue exactly there. Next slide. Okay, so here, do you remember that um, Sushaka was explaining the ABPF? So we want to build such a tool here. So uh, first, we need to know where we should put our uh, prop and is, uh, and what what kind of prop that we need, we need to use. So definitely, we have different kind of prop, props here. We have dynamic and static uh, statics, and the dynamic one uh, could be K prop and K-red uh, props, and we also have USDT uh, for the user space, and we have some static. For this project, we use some, uh, some K props and K-red uh, props. How? So here, here is the, the, uh, the props that we used. Uh, the first one is that, uh, I mean, we attach ourselves to, uh, to do page cache read ahead function. And also we attach ourselves to page cache alloc, and also we attach ourselves to mark uh, page access. Also the return of the uh, do page cache read ahead is important for us. So how, how we have done, so we see that, okay, uh, a thread 42 is, is executing and uh, do, do page ca uh, cache read ahead. And then we see that in between executing uh, this function, we see that, yeah, okay, there is a, page and cache alloc. We store the, the allocated page uh, address and also the timestamp that is being accessed, uh, that, be, that is being uh, created. And then whenever we see a marked page access and it is the same as the, uh, same as the page, uh, page address that we, we saw before. So we, uh, we take the timestamp of that, we subtract them. So it's gonna be a time that spent uh, our, our Preloaded uh, page is being, uh, being the memory, and we, we could have the delta, which is the time that uh, the time that we have we have we had access to that. And how we do that? We use uh, we maintain uh, some states uh, for to see to see if if um, if we are in the uh, we are reading a, a page cache. We store the uh, the, the PID of the and the, the thread that is being executed. And whenever we are inside them, uh, that do page cache read ahead, uh, we set the flag one, which is we are in, inside that, uh, that uh, thread. If inside that thread, we have a page alloc, uh, page cache alloc, we store the, uh, you can see here, we store the, uh, the, the page address and also uh, the, the, the timestamp. Then we, whenever we have an access, Mark page access. You see that if, if we, have, we are accessing the same same page that we stored before, so we, we cal calculate data. We also calculate uh, the, the number of uh, allocated page for the page cache, also and the number of uh, heated, which is the heat for uh, the page cache. So for that, I'm gonna bring a demo to show you uh, show you how how does it work. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Oh, oh. Share my screen. Okay, now you could see my screen. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So to, to do that, uh, first I'm gonna show, uh, show you where the file is. Uh, so it's been committed here, read ahead, uh, ahead uh, stat. And we have different uh, Python files, which are our um, analysis tools. So we use this one. Um, so here, as I mentioned, uh, we, we have some props. And uh, so to the entry of the page cache read ahead to the 
um, to the exit of page, uh, page cache uh, reader here to find out if it's been done. And then when, whenever uh, there's an access, uh, so uh, we, uh, we, we find the delta here and which is the time that it's been, uh, that, that uh, page was in the memory. And then at the end, we push everything to InfluxDB to be able to, um, to actually uh, to visualize it later. So the visualization tool that we use is Grafana. Uh, so I have it running run it here. So I create a dashboard for that, uh, which you could see here. Let's make it five. So then I'm going to run the tool, which I showed you before. <clears throat> it's running. Then I'm going to introduce a load. So I use Sysbench to uh, make some load. So we could see that, OK, here we have some unused. Uh, so we have some heat here. Let's make it. Hours. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So we could see that. Okay. Uh, so we have some heat. Uh, we should. We should. Uh, we, in the bucket of eight millisecond to sixteen millisecond, we have some like uh, one eighty four heat. Um, in a bucket of four millisecond, eight millisecond, uh, which which means that it took eight millisecond to access that, uh, that memory here. So, and it's going up and it's, it's keeping updated. So in here, uh, we have a, a dashboard that's showing, showing the, uh, the unused page and used page. So, so it means that uh, we read a bunch, uh, bunch of pages, but 183 of them were unused, actually. So yeah. So this, this does look like a healthy system, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's reading. I mean, sequentially, it's, it's fine. If this screen uh, was a lot, so it means that uh, the actually the read ahead buffer doesn't work very well. So especially in the, so 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 there there are two things that I have to mention that this this one is gonna add a lot of overhead to the system because you know, for each memory access you have to run your AVP uh, program. So that's a little bit. Uh, I mean. Uh, at, at, at overhead and also uh, for example sometimes we have some, so so this is this is so good for rotational disk uh, for the SSD if you use uh, for example read ahead buffers maybe maybe it's not good at all to use it I mean uh, we don't need read ahead buffer because the, I mean and the disk is so fast so we can access it so you don't need to buffer them and uh, full the memory for that Okay, so you can download this um, simple tool that we have created, read ahead stat from this link. And I hope you would hack around with this and look at more uh, ways to get some more information about your file system and not. So this is just an example for uh, read ahead cache performance. So there are many other avenues uh, and many other ways in the file system which you could optimize your reads, optimize your writes, and, and it's up to you now to take this tool and you know, hack around with it. Uh, this brings us back to the end of the slide. Uh, thanks a lot. I hope you all enjoyed it and we'll be here for questions. Uh, you can also directly uh, ask questions to us on Twitter or just mail uh, to us as well. Um, thanks a lot, everyone. And um, you know, I hope you have a good day and a good night and a good evening wherever you are. Thanks. Thank you.